Hi there and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed learning about Gitflow as a way to blend version control and documentation to help us to collaborate with ourselves in a more reproducible manner. I admit Gitflow is, is a bit of an advanced move, but if you feel like you've got Git pretty well under control, I really would encourage you to try to use Gitflow as part of your process. If nothing else, you could use it as a checklist to go through as you address comments that are made by collaborators or reviewers. I've also found that using it to outline the steps that I need to take to develop a project can also be pretty useful. I really like how we can use branches in the issue tracker to reflect the bush-like aspects of doing science. Too often we portray science as this linear process. Uh, we get to the end of a beautiful paper, um, but we don't see all the convoluted paths that we know <laughs> um, happened along the way. At some point though, we'll want to move from collaborating with ourselves to collaborating with others. Today's lesson We'll discuss how we can use additional tools from our reproducible research toolbox to foster that collaboration with others. Baked into our discussion is an attempt to improve the reproducibility by improving the quality of our code. We'll discuss how we can use GitHub's collaborative tools to foster a review of our code by others and also solicit the contributions from others. Again, this is another advanced move that you may want to ease into. Join me now in opening the slides for today's tutorial which you can find within the Reproducible Research Tutorial Series on the rifamonas.org website. So in the last lesson, we used Gitflow as a more systematic way for making changes to our project. Our first issue that we dealt with was simulating our PI, noticing that our axis labels on our NMDS ordination plot still had PCOA. Oh, later, when we were looking at uh, the output of our rendered manuscript document, we perhaps noticed that the figure legend said PCOA instead of NMDS. So as today's pop quiz, what I'd like you to do is use Gitflow to fix this typo. Go ahead and pause uh, the video now and go uh, work on it on your own. And then uh, once you start the video again, I'll show you how I did it. I need to file an issue. So this is issue five. So we're gonna go to our directory and we can do git checkout dash b issue underscore zero zero five. And we can open up our submission manuscript.rmd file. And I'm gonna search for PCOA. Ah. So I'll do non-metric dimensional scaling ordination of theta yc values um, relating the community structure, blah, blah, blah. Yep, that's great. And so we'll save back out, get status. That a change, we can do make.n write.paper. All right, make write.paper. And I'm going to go into FileZilla and log into my instance. And I just want to make sure that my uh, PDF file looks right. And sure enough, if I see that, non-metric dimensional scale, blah, blah. Great. So that's all good. So I will go back to my terminal and I'll do git status, git add submission, manuscript.star, git status, git commit dash m correct figure legend closes number uh, just want to double check that this is issue five yep it's five 
it should close as number five. Get status. Great. Do get checkout master. Get merge master. Yep, sorry, get merge issue underscore zero zero five. That merges in. And I can get status. And I can now do get push. Very good. And I see that I've closed my issue and we're good to go. So hopefully that was a good review of what we did in the last tutorial. And again, as you see, we're, we're slowly building to our toolbox, reusing a lot of what we've used previously, whether it's documentation, organization, version control. These are all um, great tools that we're building on to again, improve the reproducibility of our projects. In today's tutorial, we're gonna expand further. In today's tutorial, we're gonna expand again to use Gitflow for working in a team. Uh, we're going to use ourselves, perhaps as our team for today, just to try things out, or with an actual team. We're going to make a pull request. This is new jargon related to version control to incorporate new code. We're going to integrate an external review of our code into the Gitflow workflow. And then we're going to apply many of the principles that we've been working on throughout the series of these tutorials. We're going to continue to expand our, um, our skill set. So, we have this annoying postdoc in the lab, and they think they have this great idea. Postdoc says, you're using ours based graphics. You should be using the tidyverse. You reply, eh, you know, I have a plot. It says what I want. It works. It's very functional. But it'd be really easy. You should totally change your code. You reply, make a pull request, and I'll think about it. So telling somebody to make a pull request is kind of a good way to get a conversation to end. It's kind of the way that you can bioinformatically <laughs> drop the mic and get them to shut up and get them to do the work for you. So what is a pull request? Pull requests are a mechanism that allow others to contribute to your project, but that give you or someone you designate the power to accept or reject the contribution. The pull request can then be discussed between you and the contributor and allow the contributor to make changes before you finally accept or reject the contribution. So how do we think about this with Gitflow? Well, as a project gets bigger or more public, more people might want to contribute. And so we can delegate issues to different contributors. So remember, one of those steps was to take ownership of the issue so that others aren't going to be um, working on top of what you're doing. We don't want all contributors to have the ability to merge to the master branch. And so a pull request then gives you the authority to designate who can make uh, those merges to the master branch of the project. Also, even on a project with a single developer, you may not want to be able to merge ch your changes to master uh, without someone seeing your code first. And so some of the concepts that we'll be discussing before we're done with this is the idea of a fork, an upstream repository, a pull request, and code review. And so again, thinking about this as an extension of Gitflow, what we would do is to fork a repository into our own GitHub account, claim the issue from the primary copy of the project's repository. Alternatively, we will file an issue and ask the developer whether they'd be interested in a pull request on this issue. And so again, if it's a big project and um, it's not somebody you know, um, you might want to file a pull request. You might want to to ask the original, the lead developer first whether or not they would even accept a pull request before you go do a bunch of work. Within your own repository, your own copy of the repository, you'll create a branch, you'll make the changes, you'll commit, uh, you'll commit those changes, you'll then merge the upstream copy back into your local copy to resolve the differences, and then we'll push our copy to our GitHub account and then file a pull request to the original version of the repository. And then we can re repeat these steps four through seven until the developers accept or reject your pull request. So again, this workflow has a lot of jargon in it that we're not, <coughs> we're not familiar with yet. And so as we go through today's tutorial, these will hopefully make a lot more sense. So if you don't already have an account for your lab, go ahead and create one. So my group already has one that we use to support each of our manuscripts. 
And so that way um, we have this organization, Schloss Lab, and so any manuscript that's written and has a repository, the final repository is stored within the Schloss Lab uh, account. Uh, if you're at an academic institution, you can tell GitHub that you're an academic or at a nonprofit, and they will give you unlimited free repositories. Just be sure you make them public when you finally submit your papers. So how do you sign up for a new organization? Well, let me go ahead and uh, get out of the slides and go over to GitHub and show you how we do this. All right, so up here in the plus sign, there's an option for a new organization. You can click on that. You can then click your organization name, and again, mine is Schloss Lab. That's already taken because that's me. <laughs> uh, we can put our email address in here. Um, so even if even if you've, you're an academic and you're gonna have a free account, you could put it in here. And so I could then say, uh, you know, uh, pschloss at blah 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 dot edu, right? And then we could choose our plan. So again, being an academic click on the free option, and then create your organization. So it's, it's really that simple uh, to create or, an organization. I would encourage you to talk with your PI, or if you're the PI, <laughs> um, about setting up an organization and make sure that you have their go ahead before you do this. But I, I would really encourage your lab to have its own organizational account. I always get nervous when I see manuscripts with repositories under uh, the, the, the postdoc or student's name, because that person may not stay in academia. And of course, the PI may not stay in academia either, um, but there's a greater chance the PI is going to persist in academia rather than a student or postdoc. So um, it's nice to have a kind of a, a corporate account to hold all of the projects from your research group. All right, so once you've done that, I'm going to go back to my Kozich reanalysis um, repository. that and I'm going to go to settings and what we're going to do is we're going to transfer the ownership of this repository to Schloss Lab or whatever lab you are in and we're going to scroll down to the bottom to the danger zone and we're going to transfer our ownership click transfer and we need to type in the name of our repository, which is um, to, uh, sorry, Kozic Reanalysis AEM 2013. And the name, the username or organization that we want to transfer it to, Schloss Lab. So I understand, transfer this repository. And I am going to click the green transfer button to make that transfer happen. And so we mo we're moving Schloss Lab, we're moving the repository to Schloss Lab Cosa Tree Analysis AM 2013. Might take a few minutes. So, so I'm going to go look for my Schloss Lab repository. And view Schloss Lab. And so we see now that COSA Tree Analysis AM 2013 is here. And I'm going to similarly now go back to my profile, look at my repositories, and now see that my COSA Tree Analysis is no longer here. So I'll go back, um, go back to my Schloss Lab version, and there we are. So what we've done is we've created an organization for our research group. Again, if you already had one, that's great. Um, if not, well, now you do. Um, we've transferred ownership from our personal account uh, of this COSA tree analysis to ownership in Schloss Lab. And so it has been moved. Um, it's no longer in our thing. And, and like I was saying before, I think it's a good idea to have the lab account hold on to the ownership of the repository. So uh, this might seem like a bit much for um, projects, again, where you're the only researcher. But as I was saying earlier, it does create a structure where others in your group, uh, that annoying postdoc, the awesome PI, others can reinforce your code. Um, and it also will help us to reinforce best practices for contributing to other pra projects. So 
um, what we're going to end up doing here is what's called a fork of this repository to make a new copy in our private account, our personal account. And so to make our own copy, we're going to do what's called a fork. And so you'll see this button. You'll see this button in the upper right corner. We can click fork. And I'm going to fork the repository to pschloss. And so this takes a, a bit. And it doesn't take too long. And eventually um, it shows up. So now if we look in the upper left corner, we see we're in pschloss, which is my personal account in the repository Cosa Tree Analysis AM 2013. And it said that, that this is forked from Schloss Lab Cosa Tree Analysis AM 2013. So congratulations, you've forked your first repository. This is pretty cool. Again, what you have is a copy of the repository in the Schloss Lab uh, project folder. In, and the copy now is in your own personal um, account. And so you, we're going to be able to make changes in our personal account, and we're going to hopefully then ask Schloss Lab to pull those changes into Schloss Lab. So we need to get a local copy onto AWS. So first, our local repository is already looking for the remote uh, GitHub repository on our account, right? Because we had started this <laughs> um, in pschloss. Um, we deleted it on GitHub and then moved it. As we deleted it, we moved it uh, to schloss. Uh, but we still have that. Um, and then we forked it back to pschloss. But we still have. Uh, it, our AWS repository is still looking for it in pschloss, so it doesn't know any of this has really happened. Um, so that's cool. Alternatively, and, and probably the better way, would be to delete our Cosa Tree Analysis directory on AWS to uh, clone it um, from pschloss Cosa and then re-render the data. So we've done this a few times. We know it works. We know it takes probably about 45 minutes to an hour to run all this. I'm going to skip this for now. And for, for this project, we're going to use our local repository that's already looking for the remote. Uh, the remote is, again, GitHub, that we've got our local uh, repository on AWS or on your laptop, perhaps. And our remote is what's being stored at GitHub. So what is the remote? As I said, uh, we've been looking on our, our local version of the repository on AWS. Um, the remote is what's on GitHub and is under your account now. We need a second remote, though, which, which we're going to call upstream, that tells Git what the version upstream of the parent or the parent of our repository is. So we have a remote, and then we kind of have a remote to the remote, <laughs> if you will, that we'll call upstream. And the upstream repository, you can think of as like the official copy, and that's the copy in Schloss Lab. We can look at the remotes by doing git remote dash v. We see that our remote is pschloss Cosa Tree Analysis AM 2013. That's what we'd expect. And the name of that remote is origin. So you might not remember this, but way back when, when we did our first push, we did git push origin. We were pushing to our origin, uh, which is uh, our repository copy on GitHub under pschloss. But we need to set our upstream remote. So to do that, we're going to do git remote add, and we're going to say upstream as the name of our upstream remote. And we can go back to um, click on this link that we forked from, and we can get a copy, copy the address to this repository by clicking on the green clone or download button, and then clicking on uh, the copy button, coming back to the terminal and pasting that in, hit enter, and then we can do git remote dash v, and we see now that we have our origins and our upstreams. So one of these is to fetch, which is kind of to, to pull stuff down from GitHub, and the other is to push, which is to put things up, and we have a fetch and a push both for origin as well as for upstream. So you'll notice that we have a fetch and a push for our origin and our remote. And so we've talked about push already, where we take what's in our current repository and we push it up to GitHub. Um, fetch brings down the commits from the remote branch that are not in our current branch and stores them locally. 
a merge then will bring the stuff we've just pulled we've just fetched and it merges it into the branch that we're on so we can do that in one step with a pull so when we do git pull we're both fetching and merging at the same time and so um, that's why we see fetch rather than pull pull because it's it's breaking it down into those two steps if you're not careful as you're doing your pulls uh, you might run into conflicts and so that's why sometimes people f prefer to do a git fetch and then a git merge rather than a git pull and so when we're working with our um, upstream we will do git fetch git merge so what does this look like in practice we can do git pull origin which is already up to date and then we can do git fetch upstream so git pull origin is pulling it down from p schloss git fetch upstream is pulling it down from schloss lab and so this now tells us that there are two branches issue 4 and master that it's brought down and we can then do git merge upstream forward slash master. So this is telling Git that we want to merge the master branch from upstream, which is right here, into the master branch that we're on um, in our thing. But before I do that, let me just make sure which branch I'm on, because I don't know that I moved back. Yep, I did. So we are on master. So that's a good thing to always double check. So I'm going to do git merge upstream forward slash master and of course it says we're already up to date you could imagine though that if we had forked it and maybe sat on it for a day or two um, and, the, and someone else had pushed something uh, into the Schloss lab version that our version on our repository might be different than the upstream version and so it's good to always merge our origin version back into our local version to make sure that we're working on the the most recent version of the code so what we'd like to do now is to create an issue in github in the schloss lab the upstream version of the repository so we'll go issues new issue and we will say convert nmds uh, plot to use tidy verse packages and we'll leave a comment to say um, uh, the postdoc thinks we should convert plot nmds.r to from using base r functions to instead use um, functions use yeah functions from the tidyverse packages dplyr and ggplot2 and so we might submit that issue and we might let it sit right and we go away and we think about it some more and we say you know if we were to use dplyr and ggplot there's a lot of code in that plot nmds that that's just kind of doing funky things if you look at that code there's all sorts of little things in there that the more i think about it i just don't like and that it would be good to refactor that code to make it um, a bit more elegant, a bit more easy, a little bit easier to maintain. So I'm going to take on this issue. So I'm going to assign it to myself and I'm going to add a comment. I'm going to say, the more I think about it, I agree with the postdoc. I agree because I think it will help to make the code easier to maintain and so I'll comment here and again we can we can use assignees we can use labels we can add these to different things we can um, add people on to the discussion to get their feedback we can have a dialogue here all right so I've claimed this so I have claimed this issue for myself. I'm now gonna go back to AWS and I'm going to create a branch in my local repository for the issue. 
I will do git git status just to make sure I'm on the right branch. I'm on branch master. I can do git checkout dash b and I will then call it issue 005. Just double check that's the issue. Oh, no, nope, I'm sorry, it's issue 6. Get status, we're on issue 6. And now we want to edit our code. So we can then do nano code forward slash plot nmds.r. And this is our R file. And again, because this isn't an R tutorial, I'm going to do some copying and pasting from the slides. And I apologize for that. Again, it's, it's in the slide deck if you want to take a look at it in greater detail. But we're going to use dplyr and ggplot with our mutate commands and ggplot to build the plot. Um, the inputs are the same. The output is still that gg save. The function name is still plot nmds. All right, so the dependencies and the output are the same. So I will save this and quit. Get status. Make dash n write dot paper. That looks right. So we'll do make write dot paper. And I will now go into FileZilla and I will look at my manuscript.pdf to make sure that all looks right. And we see our, um, our plot, our ordination for uh, the uh, ordination, right? Using tidyverse, using the ggplot. And so we um, see that. And so that all looks good. Maybe our legend could be shifted over a bit. Um, Maybe I'll go ahead and do that. And let's see, where do I have that? So legend position, 0 0.15, 0 0.15 uh, is, I think that's right there. So maybe I'll put it to 0 0.5 on the x-axis. Make write dot paper. And open this up again. Uh, I think I think what I think what it's doing is it's putting it halfway across, not at the actual x coordinate. So I will edit that again to maybe make it 0.75. And make write that paper one more time, and this sh we should be good. <laughs> Great, so our legend's out of the way now. Okay, so that looks great. I think we're ready to ship this back and commit it and, and make our pull request. Get status, I'm gonna move this up. For some reason it's made rplots.pdf. I don't want that, so I'm gonna do rm rplots. This is not being tracked, so I don't need the get rm. So it's, it's not tracked, so we can delete it. Get status get add code plots results figures nmds submission manuscript pdf get status great get commit dash m refactor code to use tidy verse addresses number six get status great so we're on our branch issue six we've made our change we've made our commit we now want to push our branch and so we saw this yesterday that we can do git push but uh, before we push, we want to double check that nothing's changed on the upstream repository. So I'm going to do git fetch, git merge upstream forward slash master, and we see we're already up to date. So good. 
So now we can push. So we do git push origin. So we're going to push to our version in our account under pschloss or under your version, whatever wherever that is. Origin um, issue underscore zero zero six. You may have to enter your credentials. I don't know. And so now we see that it's pushed it up. There's a new branch. We come back to um, to me and go to my profile and my repositories. And I see that I recently pushed up a branch, issue six. All right. And so I would like to compare and make a pull request. And so this creates a form to open a pull request that is going to use as our base fork, what we're comparing it to, what we're trying to, um, we're requesting that Schloss Lab pull our version from pschloss. And so it says able to merge. These branches can be automatically merged because we did that git fetch, git merge upstream. And so I can now leave a message in here and I can say, I've refactored the code to use um, dplyr and ggplot two uh, functions. I feel better about the ability to maintain this code. I think I like this version a bit more than the original using uh, the base graphics functions. Okay, great. So we've entered a comment to the uh, maintainer of the Schloss Lab version. I can then click create pull request and it thinks for a minute. <laughs> um, it sees that there was a comment there that I added, uh, a commit that's here. And so it then says um, that, that this pull request could be merged. So I'm the owner of Schloss Lab. Uh, which is why we see it gives me this nice green button. So don't push on that yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask someone to critique it. And so I'm going to again simulate this by saying, um, uh, thanks for the contribution. This looks great. Uh, before we accept the PR, the pull request, could you indicate in the readme file that the user needs to have dplyr and ggplot2 packages? I'll say the um, installed before running the code. Okay, so we're going to push this back to pschloss, and I'll say comment. So we've gotten this feedback, and now what we want to do is we want to go back into our COSA tree analysis. I'll do git status to make sure I'm still on issue six as a branch, and I will open up readme.md, and I will scroll down here where I had dependencies and locations, and I will add uh, dplyr and ggplot2 and that's saved. I'll then come back and do git status. That's been modified. Git add readme git commit dash m. I'll say add uh, dependencies to readme addresses number six and then I will again do my git fetch upstream git merge upstream forward slash master 
it's all good. And so now we can do get push origin issue 006. It pushes that up. And now we come back to our pull request and then we see added dependencies to readme addresses issue six, right? And so we've got uh, that commit is automatically added into our pull request. So then the developer or the owner of the repository writes back, these changes look great. Thanks for your contribution. I'll do fireworks, bam, okay. And so then we will comment we will then merge the pull request and we will confirm the merge. And so our pull request has successfully been merged and closed. You're all set. The pschloss issue six branch can be safely deleted. And so if I click delete branch, it deletes that branch and we can then come back to our issue and we can then say close issue. Great, and so it adds to the transcript of this issue that the issue was addressed by the merge pull request from pschloss issue six. So we wanna update our local repository and we will get back to master. So we'll do git checkout master and we can then do git fetch upstream, get merge, upstream, master. And that's been brought in. Again, if we do get status, we see that our branch is ahead of origin master by three commits. So our personal ver version of the repository is three commits behind of the upstream as well as our local. So we wanna fix that by doing git push And we can also, uh, reminding our branches, git branch, we could do git branch dash d issue 006, or we could keep it or whatever. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out now, and we'll do exit, exit. And I'm gonna stop my instance So GitHub allows us to set guidelines to potential contributors for how they make those contributions. So we can state explicitly our community and behavioral expectations that there's no name calling, no snark, uh, no being jerks. <laughs> um, we can provide links to external documentation, mailing lists, or a code of conduct in terms of um, how we set those expectations. We can also um, beyond expectations of behavior, we can describe what our, good, what our expectations are for creating good issues or pull requests. And so Mozilla at this link has a great checklist for you to think about. Um, so for example, uh, a pull request should really focus on one thing. And so our maximum submission should be a maximum length of perhaps 400 lines of code, maximum function lengths of about 50 lines, our code must be able to be automatically merged in as we saw, uh, and we were able to achieve that by doing the git fetch, git merge. If there had been a problem with merging, we would have had to resolve those merges before we then uh, pushed to our origin and then did the pull request to the upstream repository. Um, if you have tests, uh, kind of like our make write.paper, they must all pass. Functions should be tested. Uh, functions should be documented. Uh, they should respect a style guide um, and indicate what issue the contribution addresses. And then finally, in the pull request to summarize and annotate the changes. So we can, we can kind of stipulate these requirements or these steps for making good issues and good pull requests. When we look at our issue tracker, um, we'll see a link um, either up here or down to the side for how to make good contributions to the repository. Again, if we go into GitHub and say I want to file a new issue, you may notice that down here in the lower right corner, there's a link for helpful resources. And so here you see all those things that I had just mentioned. And so where does this come from? Well, this is coming from our contributing.md file. 
Another good resource that I have in the slide notes, as you'll see, is a link to the Software Carpentry page for their, um, their contributing.md file for what they expect from people to make contributions to their repositories. A big part of making these pull requests is having someone else look at our code. Just like we simulated someone saying, hey, it'd be really nice if the readme included dplyr and ggplot2 as packages that need to be installed. We need others to look over our code and make sure that we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. You need to get over the quality of your code. Um, that's the purpose of having a review. You know, if, if, you, if you don't want people to look at your code, um, that, that's a bigger problem, right? And so we need to get used to people looking at our code, making suggestions, and that's really the only way we're going to get better. I know that my writing of, of narrative has gotten better because of peer reviewers looking at uh, manuscripts I've submitted, and I know having people look at my code will only make me a better programmer. Uh, think about what you want to get out of your code review. Um, what is your goal? You know, do you do you want to make sure that you're writing code that people understand, that works, that is readable, all of the above, right? So think about that, and think about that as you, you know, um, you ask someone to review your code. You can solic rev solicit reviews from your PI, collaborators, colleagues, random strangers, people on Twitter, wherever. Um, do it early and often to prevent code backlog to get the best feedback. So really, um, there have been studies that have shown that you've got to keep it under 500 lines of code or it just gets to be too much for somebody to look at. And, and, and if you have to give someone 1,000 lines of code, then that might indicate that there's probably a problem with your code, that it needs to be broken up into more modular segments. And also just the psychology of getting this reams of paper, reams of code um, is, is not going to um, get a lot of enthusiasm from potential reviewers. So your review can be live, uh, like in a lab meeting. So in our lab meetings, periodically we'll have somebody put a few lines, of, you know, maybe 150, maybe 50 lines of code um, on the projection. And we'll go through it line by line and comment on the code. Um, it could also be asynchronous. So it's perhaps be more like peer review for a paper where you, you ask someone to look at your repository and to perhaps a specific file in your repository and ask them to review that code for you. If you're reviewing someone else's contribution, Mozilla has a really nice guide for thinking about code review. And so these are some of the questions that were taken from that guide. And so they break it down into intrinsic examination as well as extrinsic examination. So are the functions as simple as possible? Is the code efficient? Is the usage of each function clear? Is there documentation on how you use that? Um, have edge cases been considered? So kind of like things where um, you know, dividing by zero. I think we talked about that when calculating Shannon diversity when we were doing R coding. Um, have those edge cases been considered in the function? Extrinsic examination. Uh, does the new code reinvent any wheels? Are there packages that could have been used instead that are already pretty well developed and tested and, and robust? Does the new code successfully address the needs of the project? And does the new code respect the structure of the project? Right? These pull requests should not be totally revamping the whole code base of a project. That does not respect the structure of the project, but it should instead work within what the goals and the structure of the existing project. I'd like to leave you with a few questions to think about. So based on what we've learned in this series of tutorials, why should the quote final version of your repository be in your group's organization and not just your own private account? I think there's a few reasons for that. Look around the GitHub version of your lab's copy of the repository. How would you add someone from your lab to review your code? So noodle around um, on those pages and, and see if you can figure out how you would add someone uh, to, to be a, an approved manager or someone that can approve pull requests to your lab's code. And finally, ask yourself, who could provide a review of your code? Are there people within your local community, within your lab, um, or that you know through social media or you know through meeting people at conferences that would provide a review of your code. The final thing I want to leave you with is a opportunity to get a quote virtual badge for completing these tutorials. And so on the uh, homepage of the Reproducible Research Tutorial Series, you'll notice that there's an honor roll. So um, you and your picture and your information can be added to the honor roll as an indicator that you completed this training by filing a pull request. 
And so to do this, you need to fork a repository of this repository that has all these slides for um, this tutorial series. You're going to, like as we did in this tutorial, create a local copy of the repository. You're going to add a file that's called, uh, that has your GitHub ID, whatever it is, so mine is pschloss.yml. Um, there's a copy um, or a template of what you need to use in the directory on a roll. Um, that's called template.yml. And so you're going to add that file to honor roll and you're going to complete the needed information. You're going to add your picture and the picture needs to be 300 pixels by 300 pixels. And that needs to be named again, your GitHub ID.jpg. And this needs to be also added to the honor roll directory. You're then going to add the changes to your copy of the repository, create a pull request, and then we might go through an iteration or two um, to make sure all all, everything's in a row and then we will then merge your pull request into the honor roll page and that will then get your image to show up on the honor roll and will allow you to say that you've completed this training in reproducible research practices. I really hope that you take me up on the offer of filing a pull request to receive a badge for completing the materials within this tutorial series. This activity really serves as a capstone for the entire series but Hang on for one more tutor tutorial after today's uh, to finish the series. Have you ever had anyone review your code? We were used to having our science reviewed in committee meetings, seminars, posters, papers, and grant proposals. We're reviewed constantly. But have you ever asked anyone to take a look at your code? Have you ever looked at someone else's code? My research group does this on a regular basis as part of our lab meetings. And while we still could do a lot more with it, uh, it's really been helpful to get people to learn to code better and to identify potential problems. Some groups have varying policies on who can accept pull requests and what steps have to be taken to approve those pull requests. At the minimum, people will push directly to the master branch without code review. Others require that the contributor cannot accept the pull request themselves. Still others require one or two or more people review the code before accepting that pull request. These requirements can get kind of onerous if you're the only one working on your project or if no one else in your group is familiar with programming. If this level of rigor interests you though, I'd really encourage you to use your social media or your network of friends to reach out and ask someone to review your code to help you out. Similarly, you can also make the same offer to review other people's code. I think you learn a lot by looking at other people's code and comparing it to your practices as well. I have to admit that I used the tools we've been talking about in this series long before I started thinking about code review and um, branches and pull requests. Now I think of a fork as a bit of a firewall between what seems like a good idea to me and what is truly a good idea for the project. You can think of it as an added level of security for ensuring the replicability of your work. In the next tutorial, we'll finish this series by discussing the value of openness and transparency and reproducibility. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.